Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes. Charles spoke yesterday about personal improvement. And part of my job, I'm part of product management, part of my job is uh, speaking. And, you know, I'm already versed in speaking to people after lunch, but speaking to people with food induced coma who look like headless people, that's new. I think next one will be a TED talk, and after that, I'm going to United Nations. <laughs> so, um, we're going to talk to you today about uh, the very exciting continuous testing maturity benchmark. Um, I'm going to be uh, joined by a super, super smart data scientist, Fernando. And then we brought a customer on board to tell you that we're not just telling you stories. So you're in the hot seat. Uh, Phil from uh, the New York Times. So I'm going to tell you a little bit of the, of the tale that led us here. Why did we decide to do it? What did we hear from our customer base? And then Fernando is going to take you through the data science that brought us to this score um, and, uh, and how it works and how it comes together and some of the validations. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about how we're going to serve this up to you so you can utilize this. Um, and we're going to close with a couple of questions, a couple of perspectives from Phil, how this is being implemented in New York Times, and hopefully we'll get some time for some questions. So basically, all of us in this game are here because the organization, the businesses we're part of are in the business of, are going through a digital transformation, no matter where you are. Digital transformation means that the experiences that, de deliver, that we deliver to our customer base are going over the internet, they are personal, they are enjoyable, and they fulfill a cause, they fulfill a purpose. Um, and in that, our customers know that there is competition. And so we need to accelerate what we do. The velocity of delivering a feature to the market requires acceleration, otherwise our, our competition will eat our lunch, as they say. But in reality, what we see is that the software testing practice hasn't evolved as fast as software innovation and software delivery practices. And this is really what SauceCon is all about. How do we assure the quality of the deliverable at the same time of delivering innovation at a faster velocity? So this requires change. And again, going back to Charles, change is hard. Change is meaningful. And a lot of people resist change. And so many of the vendors that you'll see in any space that involves change have something called a maturity uh, matrix. And you've seen this yesterday. It was a phenomenal video. I loved it at the beginning of the day, if you remember. This was 9 AM, so hopefully you guys were all alive. And <laughs> um, but these things basically follow an entry. You start testing manually. And then you take a suite of tests, you select a suite of flows, and you turn that into automation. And then you figure out how to scale that and figure out reliability and so forth. And eventually, we want to bring you to a place where you test all the things and test them all the time. The issue with this matrix, and if you, with this matrix, <clears throat> and if you think about the previous uh, research that I've shown you, it's, a, it's all about perception. Right? It's all about a feeling and the set of activities that you do. The question becomes, when you go to your boss, if you're a development lead, if you're a Q QA lead, if you're an agile coach, and you want to instill practices of optimizing this journey that we're going through, of improving the software testing practice, how do you show your boss improvement? How do you instill trust in the, in, in the testing community around you, in, in the organization, that you are on the right path? How do you identify which areas are top priority to improve on? So this is what led us to think about this, uh, this benchmark. And now, Fernando will take you through the details of how it works. All right, thanks. So before we dive into the details, I just wanted to talk a little bit about why we kind of thought that Sauce Labs was in a pretty unique position to try to come up with an index like this. Um, and really, it's a, a matter of the amount of volume of tests that we run like every single day. So we're literally running many, many millions of tests 
for thousands of users every single day. So this benchmark is basically our attempt at trying to leverage that data set to kind of fi figure out, uh, you know, based on the data, what are some uh, rules of thumb that are pretty universal for, to ensure that customers have success with their automated testing. So it's informed by data and it's also informed by uh, opinions about what we think uh, best practices are. So we'll, with that, we'll dive into it. So basically this benchmark is an index uh, between zero to 100 that is the average of four components. And every one of these components is driven by a particular KPI. So we'll run through them. The first one is test quality. Uh, and that is basically essentially based on the average rate at which your tests are passing. Uh, test runtime is the second component which is uh, the average time it takes for a, one of your typical tests to, to finish executing. And the third component is platform coverage. So how broad are you testing when you're running your applications? How many different platforms are being tested on? And the last one is uh, concurrency, which is essentially a measure of how well you're leveraging concurrency to get um, the fastest feedback cycle you possibly can when you're trying to run a suite of tests. So those four components all get a score zero to 100 and the benchmark index is an average of these four. So I'm gonna dive into every one of these in details and we're gonna look at charts like this for each one. The chart on the left is basically that sliding scale of the KPI for this component uh, and how it relates to the score that you get for that particular component. So in this case, uh, the standard for excellence, where you get 100% uh, index score, is a pass rate on average of 90% or above. And you can see on the right where our customer base, which is what this uh, benchmark index is sampled from, uh, it shows um, that about 20% of customers hit that benchmark. And then it's a sliding scale all the way down to 50%, which basically means that uh, a test pass or failing is the same as a, a coin flip on average. So this particular measure is really important. There's a lot of reasons why tests fail. It could be that there's a large number of your tests that are broken that continue just to just run and they've been quarantined and just annotated as being useless. Uh, there could be tests that are flaky. Um, and then uh, there's also the possibility that the application broke. And what you really want in a test suite is to have confidence that when a test fails, it's actually indicative of the application breaking. And to do that, you've got to make sure that uh, your, your tests are not flaky, that you quickly repair broken tests, and that you don't let tests that are not adding any more value clog up your, your testing pipeline. And uh, essentially, that uh, threshold for success being 90% or above, that means that on average, you know, 10% of your tests might fail. That gives a lot of leeway for there to be tests that, that are broken and not yet fixed, for there to be some tests that are flaky, and for occasionally to an application, for an application bug to, you know, result in a failure. But um, as soon as it starts getting to the point where there's just a large proportion of tests that are expected to fail across your, all the tests that you run, uh, that's when, you know, the score starts to get knocked down. And this is a big thing that drives this is you need to be fixing tests fast, faster than the rate at which they're breaking. And if you're fixing at a rate that's slower, the number of broken tests is just gonna rise and rise and you're gonna lose functional coverage, uh, you know, the longer that goes on. So it's really important to have high quality test suites that uh, the, a signal of fail is like really a good signal as opposed to just kind of this ambient level of, of failure that is to be expected. So it's really important component of the index. So the second component is test runtime and the standard of excellence here for 100% score, you've got to uh, keep your average test runtime uh, two minutes or less. We had to put the, the threshold somewhere and uh, two minutes is what we came to for reasons that we'll, we'll go into. But um, in this case, about a third of customers uh, have uh, test execution times, two minutes or less, which is a little bit better than the pass rates that we saw before, um, but it's still a challenge. So test runtime is super important because uh, your test suite is essentially bottlenecked by the longest job in the test suite. So this is a nice little visual showing like you've got 
a bunch of tests that are quick, but just one test that's super long, and no amount of concurrency or parallelism is going to, to save you from that. The other reason why short tests are really important is uh, that they're, they, short tests tend to be associated with being easier to maintain and less flaky. So this is a really cool chart that shows um, a data set of 75 million tests that ran on Sauce Labs over the last 30 days. And it shows the failure rate by runtime. So uh, if you look at the bar for tests that took longer than seven minutes, their failure rate is two times the failure rate of a test that runs in under two minutes. And uh, you know the two to seven minute bucket is a little bit less, but basically what this shows is there's a really nice step function in terms of uh, the likelihood of a test to fail based on how long it is. And this is a sign that uh, short tests tend to represent more atomic units of functionality. They are much easier to like understand and, and diagnose what's wrong. And also another benefit of really short tests is that if, if they break, uh, you know that it's testing one specific thing and you, you have a good indicator of what went wrong right away. Uh, as opposed to a test that's testing 15 different things. And if it breaks, you have to look through logs to figure out you know, exactly what thing went wrong. So the third component is platform coverage. So uh, this is the case where uh, we wanted to basically capture the importance of cross-platform testing. Uh, the standard for excellence here is to be testing on at least five different platforms. And platforms are defined as a combination of the operating system and the browser. And this component is, is, uh, is important for obvious reasons when you look at like market shares of um, the devices and platforms that, that customers consume uh, applications in. So basically the standard for excellence being five platforms there essentially covers you know, the major uh, desktop mobile operating systems plus you know, a handful of browsers. If you're testing on five or more, you're in good shape anything less than that, and you, know, you could probably be doing better. Um, and uh, if we go back to that last chart, you'll see that like, single platform testing is this tiny little sliver. And that's probably correlated to you know, Sauce Labs having the benefit of making it easy to test on a lot of different platforms. But it's just really important to keep those numbers up. And this is a case where like, a lot of our customers are, uh, are getting to uh, the, the benchmark standard for excellence in this case about 60%. So the last component is uh, test concurrency. So this is essentially not about a particular test, but about to what extent uh, a testing organization is leveraging uh, concurrency when running their tests. And the standard for excellence here is that uh, during peak times, your test suite should be utilizing 75% or more of the bandwidth in your, in your grid or in the provision concurrency that you purchase from a, a cloud testing provider. So in this case, uh, about 75% of Sauce Labs customers are, are hitting this benchmark. Um, and uh, this is like really easy to achieve with Sauce Labs because you've got really great scale, but it's also really important because basically when you're provisioning capacity, you're doing it with a plan in mind. You know, this is the size of my build times the number of platforms I want to test. You know, I should be hitting this score. So um, the fact that a, an organization is leveraging the concurrency that they plan to use is a good sign that they're uh, taking advantage of the benefits of concurrency to really have a really rapid feedback cycle. And uh, this is just a nice little visual to show why concurrency is so important. Um, so the build on the left is limited to 10 concurrent sessions at a time. And basically every, every gradient of blue there represents a different test in a test suite of 50 tests. So the build on the left is limited to 10 sessions at a time. And you see that basically you have to stack 10 tests at a time. Uh, and uh, they all have to kind of like go through um, the pipeline wait and the next 10 have to wait in line for the last 10 to finish and you end up with a 30 minute build where the test suite on the right is just leveraging concurrency to infinity and essentially starting all tests simultaneously and uh, that build is uh, really leveraging concurrency well and it will take as long as the the longest test takes to run so you've got a 5x increase in the concurrency limit um, on this build, which leads to you know, roughly a 5x uh, uh, 
uh, improvement in the time it takes to run a build as a whole. So the continuous testing benchmark index is the simple average across these four scores. And uh, what we're seeing here is the distribution of customers where they all fall. Um, and the important thing to note here is that it's really hard to get all four components right. And it's only a little over 6% of uh, organizations testing on SOS labs uh, achieve that score. 20% um, though get a, a pretty good score, but there's definitely a bulge in the middle um, and the, the idea behind trying to create a score like this, uh, and it's challenging, right? Because you have to come up with something that's you know, universal and generalizable across a lot of different organizations that are all doing different things. Um, but the goal is, if you can measure something like this, what we hope to do is by um, increasing visibility on things like this, we can kind of move that distribution more and more to the right and help customers uh, advance along this uh, continuous testing journey and get you know, more and more people into the upper ranges of this score. So with that, I'll hand it back to Amir. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Fernando. Yeah. So couple comments here so um, you know today uh, there's a uh, there's a white paper available on saucelabs.com that you can download that gives you the definitions and the initial global data that's not customer customized to a specific customer it's available on saucelabs.com we, we really in, encourage you to download it um, and give us feedback which leads me to the next topic so this is in creation it's v1 <laughs> and we are definitely um, motivated to make sure that this score actually fits your expectations and is actionable and we want to see usage on it. So if you have ideas and you have feedback and you have contributions to the future, we definitely want to know and, and like Phil, we'll get to this in a minute, but we definitely want to know if you have other metrics that you're looking at, we're considering applying weights to the different uh, metrics and so forth. But, um, and in the future, we'll get definitely going to uh, automate the delivery of this uh, benchmark through the portal, hopefully, um, you know, soon in, in 2019, um, you know, as a delivery. So, you know, we think this is really important, uh, particularly to people who are uh, focusing on how to improve the practice. As I mentioned, a development lead, um, a QA lead, an agile coach, and so forth. And so I think now is probably a very good time to turn it over to Phil, if you can join us on stage. And, um, you know, just warming you guys up for a couple more questions. Um, did you have your mic? Perfect. So Phil, maybe, maybe um, so Phil is with New York Times. Yep. And I hear that he's very good with uh, crosswords. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, I guess so. I'm a, like a Monday through Wednesday solver. And, and Phil, maybe, maybe the first question is, um, what has been your experience at New York Times dealing with the concept of measuring maturity and communicating progress towards that? Uh, yeah, so metrics, um, we struggle with concrete metrics. It's, um, we deal a lot with intangibles. We started our uh, test automation practice pretty recently, uh, about a year ago for the crossword team, uh, the web crossword team specifically, and we have good feelings. Like we know that we're getting less bugs um, prior to launches and we know that we're getting less bugs reported back. And we have great metrics around test coverage, line by line code coverage. Um, but we're excited about a report like this because we don't, um, we're not, we don't have our eye on how we're stacking up um, uh, against other custom other um, uh, companies who uh, have test practices, and um, it, it'll be good to uh, assign concrete numbers to practices that we've known all along are good. Um, It'll be nice to see uh, that we're ramping up. Our product owners, um, they have a lot of faith in us and they, they want a return on investment and they, they understand that it's hard to, uh, to get concrete measurements around these things as practitioners. Um, so the ability to deliver to them the good news that yes, uh, parallelizing our tests and keeping our tests short and really focusing on um, good automation practices is paying off for us. 
So I just wanted to mention, I don't think we mentioned that New York Times uh, did get a 100% score, and that's one of the reasons that we wanted to bring you on board. So the- I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah. Oh, we didn't tell you that? Wow, well, <laughs> let's uh, give them a round of applause. <laughs> um, so the question I have um, in the context of, you know, only a little over 6% of SAS customers achieving that score, uh, what are some of the things that you think led to success along you know, those uh, quality and efficiency metrics. Yeah, so I mean, you know, you can go track by track. Those, they're good metrics. We run a lot of tests in parallel, um, and there are challenges associated with that. Uh, you can imagine testing a crossword. It, you don't want to use Phil Wells at New York Times over 30 threads of automation because the puzzle data will collide, and this test guy's crossword will already be done by this guy, and the test will fail. So um, we invested a lot of our effort in user management and also in data management. Um, and it, along the lines of data management, we keep our tests short, which is another great metric, um, by, uh, by relying on in our component, in our integrated component tests. We rely a lot on mock data and stubs. Um, we, uh, you know, if we have states in the crossword and across all of our puzzles where we need to set up a lot of test data. If you want a puzzle that's 50% done, you don't want your Selenium robot tap, 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 tapping into a crossword to get it there. You want to inject that data from uh, uh, an API stub or it, put it into local storage if that's available for the app. So um, it's just another like meta thing that we invested time in. Uh, that helps our tests stay short. Uh, and because the tests are short, they fail less. And when they do fail, we can jump on them. If, you know, everyone has that seven minute test that goes through the entire golden path. And when it fails, it's harder to triage what's going wrong than when a tiny little test fails that's t specifically testing this one thing, you know where to look. Um, and it, of course, cross-browser support. Um, the, New York Times, uh, we're a big enough organization that we have uh, like an overarching organizational account with Sauce Labs and then uh, different teams are assigned different seats. So we support native apps. Uh, I support uh, web applications and we have applications across all sorts of different uh, platforms and environments. And so we're running across basically everything that Sauce has to offer all the time. Cool, great. Okay, maybe we want to open up to questions. I did want to mention before we open up to broad questions that uh, if you're a Sauce Labs customer, you can talk to your account manager and they're prepared to reveal your score to you and, and dive into it and dive into your score across the four components and, and work through all that data. So we are prepared for you to ask that question to your account managers. Okay, any questions? Okay, thank you. All right.